I've often quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo and James. Today, we are happy to be recording with former ISI Honor Scholar, ISI faculty member, and editor of Law and Liberty, Richard Reinch. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you for having me, James and Marlo. It's great to be here. Before we get into today's listener's question, I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who has written a review of the show on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you listen. For those of you who have not had the chance to review the show yet, we would appreciate it if you took a few minutes to rate and review Conservative Conversations. This will help us reach more listeners with the important thinkers and ideas we're discussing here. Moreover, if there are any topics or guests you want to hear from, please feel free to shoot us an email at podcast.isi.org. This week for our listener question, Sheldon asks... How can one tell when a thinker has a flaw in their personal life or thought that is fatal to the rest of their thinking? Some examples I thought up here were, uh, you know, like Karl Barth is someone who comes to mind in this regard uh, with some of his extramarital affairs. Um, And uh, obviously there was a controversy about Buckley um, recently on Twitter. And uh, in the past, there's been controversy about Nisbet and his thoughts on abortion. Uh, So, Richard, what's your answer to that question? Uh, Yeah, it's interesting. Uh I'm not one to actually probe into a lot of writers' personal lives. I tend to take them at their spoken and written word and evaluate them accordingly. I tend to think of uh, writers uh, who fail to see maybe limiting principles, the need for limiting principles of some of their work uh, in favor of making dramatic arguments uh, that seem very persuasive and... um, you know, capture a lot of people at the moment. I think in particular, a lot of our post liberals are of that, are of that kind and really sort of sleeping denunciations of the American founding on the basis of one idea largely. And that, that seems to me a, a dramatic failing and a dramatic uh, misreading and exercise of intellectual prudence. I think one thing that stands out maybe in my mind would be Walker Percy, who has meant a lot to me. He meant a lot to Peter Lawler, the subject of this podcast. Uh, he's almost a prophet of my life. Uh, his novels, in particular, to say nothing of the philosophical essays. Uh, yet, you know, Peter Lawler, man, not Peter Lawler, Walker Percy averaged five bourbons a day. That's probably a bit much. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would, I would think so. I'm sure there were healthy pores uh, as well. So um, <laughs> that might be, and yet wrote essays about bourbon that we all love and cherish. Yeah. Uh, his novels are soaked in alcohol. Um, <laughs> what might we draw from that? Also, failures in his own life with extramarital affairs. His novels are also saturated with failed marriages. And older men in particular are finding themselves located under God, but there also seems to be a recovery of a proper understanding of human conjugal love in the novels as well, which I've, I wrote an essay on marriage and the fiction of Walker Percy focusing on these failures, but also a redemption. So perhaps Walker Percy himself realized his own failings in that regard. So I, you know, it's what comes to mind is uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, where, you know, the wife, the murderous wife seeks to continue washing her hands in the novel after she's committed murder. So sort of this eccentric need to atone for sin. Uh, to to atone for something uh, without actually doing what is required for that atonement. So that might be something, you know, we might we might watch for a need to vindicate oneself in one's writings rather than just acknowledge what's what's been done. Um, I, I think that's how I would answer that question. Marlo, I know uh, you're, you're interested in sort of second, setting the record straight for Buckley. So uh, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, I, I, I saw it circulating on Twitter. Um, it seemed like it was a magazine photo of uh, Buckley coming to um, or defending, you know, not imposing uh, r- limits on abortion through state laws. Um, and I think, Sheldon, this is a great question. It's something I've ruminated over because abortion is, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it is a humanitarian issue that I consider uh, myself a single issue voter over. And it's something I, I personally won't equivocate over. So 
I do want to kind of vindicate Buckley, though, because he did re- he recognized that he was previously wrong in abortion in 1966 when he said that Catholics shouldn't oppose state legislation legislation allowing abortion. And uh, he later changed his view and argued that the pro-life cause should be embraced by any individual uh, who believes in the quality and right to life of each and every human being. And he actually later said that the, the proposition that the infant is without rights when he's in the womb is nothing more than a social convention. Uh, conflating various concerns. So with that being said, I I think we should really depend on our moral compasses uh, here as conservatives and consider the whole body of a thinker's ideas before determining whether it's all poisoned. Um, And like Richard said, I mean, you know, sometimes we have to just separate personal lives from from their their body of thought and uh, the the other literary contributions. I have plenty of uh, authors and thinkers that um, I would rather not know of their personal lives because they were uh, debauched much different than, you know, their their um, intellectual contributions. But I think we should also consider whether they ever had a change of mind. So in this case, uh, it appeared Buckley did. Yeah, I think I think that that is um, that's right. And, you know, it's sort of like the don't meet your heroes kind of idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Uh, they may have a truth. They may have found out a truth that is contrary to their own lives. But nonetheless, it is a truth. Thanks for the question, Sheldon. And for our listeners, if you'd like to submit a question for the next episode, just leave a review of the show wherever you are listening and leave a question in your review or DM us your question on social media. You can find us on all platforms as ISI. Now for our books of the week, Richard, what are you reading right now? I am reading uh, Confessions of a Heretic by Roger Scruton. Uh, it's, a, it's a new edition from Notting Hill Books, which I think is a fairly new imprint. Uh, Douglas Murray wrote the introduction. It, Roger Scruton, uh, unfortunately, uh, passed away uh, over a year ago. He's, to my mind, one of the most consequential conservative writers uh, that we had uh, in in the past two decades. He wrote books on an array of subjects. And this Confessions of a Heretic is sort of his way of um, owning up to the ideas that really separated him from the elite class which he was a, naturally in any in a sane age would have been a natural member of, but was not permitted membership of. He was chased out of academia, indeed ran for his life at a public lecture in England one time. Ended up in this country, comes back to England, um, and ran you know Scrutopia ran a, ran ran an actual farm in which he also used to educate people uh, in conservative ideas about architecture, farming. Uh, Theology, philosophy, politics. Uh, so you, you know, he, his mind was, uh, you know, truly uh, Catholic in that sense, universal, and um, you know, spoke about our need, our human social need for belonging, uh, in a lot of these subjects, and and that's what he does in this book, which is a set of nice, tight essays that you really get a sense of his mind. Scruton had this great idea of, um, I believe he called it oikophilia or the the love Oika, of home. Oikophobia to describe sort of this need to have universal democratic humane, humanitarian policies guiding our politics rather than republic deliberation about the means and ends that we in a certain country could actually achieve. So, yeah. James, what are you reading? Oh, well, I'm still I'm still sort of I, I, I keep saying this in the podcast, but I still am working my way through natural right and history, um, which has been good uh, and very instructive. Um, also about to dig into Machiavelli's The Prince, trying to sort of get back to some of the books that I read in my undergraduate that I probably didn't spend enough time with. You know, for one reason or another, there's too many classes or I you know, was a lazy student or something like that. But uh but in this instance, I think that, uh, you know, reading a lot of Strauss lately uh, has sort of pointed me toward Machiavelli. So I, I think I just want to give the prince a, a reread. So I'm looking forward to it. What about you, Marlo? I am. Uh, I was just reading Christ- uh, Christopher Lash book, but I'm, I'm kind of I'm, now I'm reading uh, Michael Knowles's book Speechless for a future ISI podcast we are recording with him. So it's it's it offers a very, um, very good analysis of why semantics matter. Um, which as someone who, you know, is a, is a writer on the side, I, I think it's really important to emphasize that um, when we're analyzing a lot of uh, sociological issues and um, how words have influence. So I'm really excited to, you know, ask him more questions about it, but uh, that's, that's what I'm making my way through right now. Before we continue with our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. 
If you would like to help us in that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. All right, Richard. Uh, we mentioned that you were an ISI Honor Scholar, a program we've talked about before in the podcast. And uh, one of the great, you know, historic faculty members at the Honors Conference was Peter Augustine Lawler, who we're going to be talking about today. Um, and he was obviously a huge influence on yourself, and you wrote a book with him. Um, I wonder if we could kind of start generally and just think about who who is Lawler and why should conservatives today be interested in his contributions to conservative thought? Well, I think for those who were students at the Honors Weeks with Peter had sort of the opportunity to be with someone uh, who loved, genuinely loved the conversation and loved to work with students. He also had the ability to stay up all night <laughs> and talk about ideas because in general, he really didn't sleep uh, that much. <laughs> and I mean, that was just sort of a particular gift that he had. He also in graduate school had the gift, uh, I'm told of, of being able to write a paper during one class while a lecture was going on and to understand the lecture while he was writing. Oh my goodness. This this is, I think he was just a gifted person um, in in multiple facets. So I, yeah, and then that humor uh, also I think came through throughout those weeks. So, you know, very, very talented person, genuine thinker, um, I think, you know, Waller, I started reading him in law school, my third year of law school, um, sort of a time when the classes seem to mean less to you as your fate at that point is typically settled. And, and my fate was settled. I, I was waiting to, to take the bar, which was where the real work was going to start and then go on to practice. And so I wasn't really that attuned to my classes. So I started reading a book called Postmodernism you know, rightly understood, which is, I think, in terms of deep works that Peter contributed, that book, The Restless Mind, are two that students should definitely read. Uh, And of course, all the ISI books, Uh, in particular, I've been just thinking about uh, Stuck with Virtue uh, was a great one. But postmodernism, rightly understood, is where Peter really starts to develop, I think, one of his distinctive contributions, which is um, modernity is over. Postmodernism isn't. Ne- mo- modernity is over. How do we know it's over? Uh, its central ideas, animating impulses, haven't been achieved. Uh, one of those was to do away with human nature through technique, through innovation, through production, uh, through the use of human ingenuity. We can overcome natural limitations. And this is in a, in a range of areas, none of which seem to have come true. We seem to be more miserable than ever. So we're in this postmodern condition. But postmodernism should not be defined by French thinkers. It shouldn't be meaninglessness. It shouldn't be, um, uh, you know, a, an aversion to reason. It shouldn't be truth does not exist and all these sorts of ridiculous ideas. Uh, it should actually be a coming to terms with this failure of modernity. And now we can recover sort of the essence of what it means to be a human person. And so I think in that regard, you know, Peter then turns to thinkers like Tocqueville, uh, Walker Percy, Leo Strauss, John Courtney Murray, Orestes Bronson, uh, among some other thinkers to help develop sort of this, this truthful reckoning with who we are. And, you know, why, as Peter said, we are in an age of freedom, so-called tremendous freedom, tremendous autonomy, whatever that means tremendous prosperity, and yet we're still left with ourselves. We're still left with the sort of this misery of the human condition, and we seem to be pretty unhappy uh, also. And I don't think that's a startling judgment. I think that's evident in a lot of ways when we look around, and that's part of the human condition. It may be worse in this age relative to others because of some choices and decisions we've made politically and academically. So uh, and intellectually. So uh, I think that's where I start with, with Lawler. Peter described this homelessness, and you mentioned, you know, he really wanted to get at the essence of what it meant, means to be a human being um, with conditions in which with our conditions in modernity. And 
He described a homelessness we experience in this world while being, uh, we are internally nudged by this desire to transcend our natural selves in the direction of God. And obviously uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche has this famous uh, thought that God was dead and that religious belief was an accidental characteristic of human existence. And for many people that is their adopted uh, outlook for the world and modernity. And so Peter said, you know, we are incurably God directed. How did this insight of his inform his beliefs about, you know, what conditions in modernity are best suited for human flourishing and for, for human dignity? Yeah, I, I would answer that by saying it's, it's sort of why, why, are we, why are we the beings um, who really don't know what to do with ourselves on a normal Wednesday, uh, say, well, you know, why, you know, why in the midst of abundance and prosperity are we also more miserable? Are we also still, you know, a, an age of, you know, think about, you know, Peter wrote about this need. We have to transform human nature using biotechnology uh, or this need to overcome what in most ages would be, you know, sadness uh, with a medical diagnosis that leads to the use of psychotropic drugs to sort of overcome that sadness and give it a clinical term like depression, not that there isn't such a thing as depression, but that this abundant need now to call it depression um, as being evidence that human nature is um, not pliable uh, or pliable the way that we think it is. Um, and, th and so that should lead us to ask questions uh, about ourselves and that as, as Tocqueville did, and Tocqueville, of course, is influenced by Pascal, that that in that um, we may not be made for this world. If we were made for this world, uh, you know, Lawler quoted Solzhenitsyn a lot in this regard, uh, technology would make us happy. Uh, happiness would be something achievable, certainly, by, by the tremendous gifts we have around us, which, you know, and Lawler was not, I mean, I, I don't want to make him sound like maybe a, a re, you know, reactionary thinker. He was not that. Is not a not an agrarian uh, in that regard, or someone who rejected modernity. Uh, he was not someone who rejected principles that we might think of as democratic or, uh, or you know, part of the liberal tradition. He wanted to ask and, and focus deeply on what it meant to be a human person. What was freedom about? What was this life for? And typically found these stat you know, standard modern answers as being deeply you know, insufficient uh, to those questions. Um, so I think in this regard, you know, before we jumped on this podcast, I was rereading one of his essays from the New Atlantis on organ markets. And, you know, as Peter says, and this is sort of Peter's analysis, he, he's not rejecting the idea that we need uh, to have uh, organs be, to be donated. But how should that happen? And would a free market in, say, organ human organs be consistent with human dignity or would it not? And it's hard for us with our language to really articulate a case against that. Um, and so most of the essay is Peter saying, yeah, maybe we should have markets and organs. But then the question becomes, well, what, is, what does that mean for consent and commerce to really dominate the full lens, the full scope of what we think it means to be a human person? Maybe you don't own your body. He wants to build to, well, if you say you own your body, then you have really no response to this. Are you satisfied with that? Maybe your body isn't your own. Maybe it points to higher principles, in which case human organs and how one might help someone who has a need for an organ transplant, that process should actually be consistent with higher principles. And so he's trying to build to a case for natural law. He doesn't want to come out and be theocratic or appear to be theocratic, or just appeal to a Christian understanding, not that he's against that, but he wants to try and show people that this sort of sense we have that maybe there shouldn't be a pure market in organs uh, is, is actually, there's something, there's a reason why. And it's that there's actually something in the human body uh, that transcends uh, its existence. And we should understand where that comes from and where it points and, and what it means. You know, you uh, you mentioned Walker Percy earlier, and a phrase that I've heard. You know, pe there's a lot of sort of Lawler Lawler folks out there, and they always appeal to his phrases, right? 
Um, and one of the phrases he used to describe the human person was wondering and wandering. And I think yeah. he got that from Percy. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what did he mean by that? I mean, it's because it, I think it's a little bit to this point of restlessness. What did he mean by that? And how do you see it affecting, or how do you see it sort of maybe even um, being put on a more full display today, perhaps? Well, in a way we're sort of talking about it on the wondering aspect, the wonder that is sort of, I mean, that's sort of a perennial aspect, I think of the Western mind. Uh, Aristotle talks about this, right? This, to be a human person is to want to know the truth. It's to be, to want to know and to understand what it means to be a human person. Um, why do I have, why, why do I form questions? Where does language come from? Why do I have this gift of language? Why do I want to reason about things? Um, and why do I have this need, you know, a, a, a religious need? I think that is a, not, not in the sense of like a sociobiological need, but, Religion seems to be etched into the human condition. It passes into different phases and modalities. Uh, maybe that's what critical race theory is about right now. I mean, that's Joshua Mitchell's argument. This is actually a religious impulse that's been deeply inverted and is now coming out in, a, in this strange way of identity. Um, so I think that's the, the wondering aspect is I am not satisfied with just work or commerce. I am not satisfied by purely um, uh, flat, democratic, egalitarian living that acts as if I don't have a soul and all I need to be concerned about is with the day to day. Um, I do have a need to transcend and I have, I have this need um, that's you know manifest to me and manifested in the sense of why don't, you know, Peter says, why are there no dolphin scientists? Why, you know, or, or as Walker Percy would say, uh, you know, when Percy's writing in the 60s and 70s, the rage was we could teach chimpanzees or orangutans language. And they would have this language gift just like we do. Well, really what you could, in all of these experiments, what it amounted to is I could force some words into their into their um, habit, but you never could you never could produce sort of the gift of language. Thousands of words, the joy of formulating and putting them together, never could be seen in primates. Only only in us, only in human persons. That's that was what Walker Percy talked about with language, and that's the wonder. Language itself, the ability to engage in abstractions, is a human quality that immaterial ability to use language. On the aspect of just wander uh, and, and the wonder and the wander is sort of man as this wayfaring being, uh, wandering. One of the best examples of this is, I think it's Percy's most autobiographical novel, which is The Last Gentleman. And you have this young man from a, a wealthy family in the South, that would, that would be Percy, uh, with antebellum roots, um, who is sort of goes to Princeton, fails out of Princeton, or is dislocated from Princeton, and ends up he's basically the equivalent of like an HVAC guy in, an, in a large building in New York. And the novel is sort of him, although, you know, sort of through this family, the Vaught family, coming to himself and also coming home again, coming back to the South with all of the prejudices um, and and also quite frankly the parts of the South that are still open. I, I mean that's sort of the that's sort of the nature of the South is this this God haunted place that and Percy sort of bringing this back to you in this novel through the story of this man and so that's he's wandering back into you know maybe the truth about himself in the novel through these um, through displays of religion and death. Uh, in the novel. Um, and, and so I think that's, that would be how I would try to, to explain wonder and wonder. It seemed like Peter did a lot of uh, 
wandering because uh, something he seemed really receptive or perceptive to is uh, television, its underlying philosophy. So like one example is his writing on the show Girls with Lena Dunham. And he also is a huge fan of Friday Night Lights, uh, which I've yep. recently started watching. And he said the show embodied what he called Southern Stoicism. Um, and he commends the high school coach, uh, football coach from uh from Friday Night Lights, Friday Night Lights, his name's Eric Taylor, for having aristocratic qualities and virtues when when leading his uh, team of high school football players. Uh, could you explain what Southern Stoicism is and how Walker Percy also fit into that uh, characterization? Peter, Peter, Peter also called that uh, Texarkana studies. <laughs> <laughs> Friday Night Lights was a, a vision of Texas. No, you know, Peter wrote a lot about how democracy. And he gets this from Tocqueville and he tries to apply it in these concrete ways. How de democracy needs aristocratic virtues. And so what you see in Friday Night Lights, which I like that show as well, is uh, and he also True Grit. And then he thought, you know, the remake of that film also displays this, which True Grit begins in Arkansas. Um, Friday Night Lights would be. Um, this example of a small town in Texas, many of the characters in the show, maybe the best part of their lives in terms of heroic displays of freedom would be high school football. Um, and then after that, you, you know, what, what would then happen uh, to them? And, and so you see with this coach, Taylor, he seems to be aware of this. He has a lot of things thrown at him and the problems of his players uh, and dealing with those and trying to help them deal with them. And that's family dysfunctionality, drug use, alcoholism, um, uh, all, you know, the fallout of the sexual revolution you see in this town in a dramatic way, it seems to hit the, the working class whites in ways that are very damaging. And it's evident in a lot of these players' lives. And you see Coach Taylor trying to hold this together while also have what is demanded of him in this small Texas town, which is a winning football team uh, that wins state championships. And uh, I think Peter liked them. Peter also, yeah, I, I can never get into girls. Uh, I think I watched, <laughs> I watched a couple of episodes and that was enough. So yeah. I, I'll, I will leave the girls' essays to Peter. Um, I think Peter thought the show displayed millennials at the time fairly well. Millennials are now an older bunch, but you know when he was writing about the show, they were still in their early twenties and seemed to be getting a lot of things wrong, and that seemed to be directly related to what they received from the boomers in terms of leadership and what had been passed down, which maybe hadn't been that much, particularly for a certain elite group of millennials. Um, Peter also wrote about the show Big Love, uh, which you know is is about this group this you know, polygamous family in Utah uh, and sort of the ways in which he's trying to deal with, you know, this situation that Peter just saw it, it was thrown in, you know, it was sort of he was thrown into it. It was a part of his life. And so how does one how does one make that work? I'll, I also sort of left that to Peter, although I watched more of that show. Um, but, yeah, no, the, the Texarkana studies and, and the show Friday Night Lights, I think, is is sort of real life and sort of these problems in America, problems that we will then see reflected about 10 years after that show emerged in, in our politics and in the changing nature of what it is to be a Republican uh, and what it is to be a conservative. And I think a lot of that is reflected in these tough experiences you, you see in the show Friday Night Lights. Um, and I think Peter sort of identified it and talked about it well, but it's a story of can you live with virtue in these circumstances and how does one do that? I'd love to uh, pivot a little bit to some of Peter's thought on the founding. At Honors this year, you gave a talk on uh, the truth about built better than they knew studies. I think probably most, maybe maybe some of our listeners will know the idea of built better than they knew, but I wonder if you could kind of give us an outline of that train of thought, some of the main players and how that affected Peter's thought. Yeah, uh, well, built better than they knew studies um is an idea that uh, Peter wrote about at length and I think brought it to its best theoretical explanation. But he's building on John Courtney Murray and the series of essays Murray wrote that was published in 1960 in a book uh, called Behold These Truths. And then Murray, although Murray never really, I don't think ever cited the Bronson, although they sound very similar, 
Bronson writing about a century earlier and coins the phrase build it better than they knew, um, which I say coins the phrase, he uses it in writing. And then the phrase itself was uttered by the American Catholic bishops, um, I want to say 1887 in, in Baltimore at what, have, what would have been a Catholic bishops conference, not the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, but something like that, or, or an early coming together of Catholic bishops in America. And in that meeting, what they're reflecting on is this tremendous gift from the American founding of religious freedom, which has given the Catholic Church perhaps something that it's never really experienced before, which is basic freedom from the government and the performance of its role as an apostolic church, which had allowed it to do amazing things in America. I mean, being Catholic in America relative to what the church had experienced in Europe was something new in the sense of you could build schools without permission from the government. Or you could set up new dioceses overnight. The canon law could operate without any uh, interference from the government. Uh, and this, so this is sort of amazing. And then thinking about this tremendous gift of freedom the Catholic Church has had, uh, they kept coming back to this, you know, the First Amendment, something that was reflected in most state constitutions. Even where there was an established church, it really didn't seem to interfere that much with, with Catholicism's operation in those states. And they said, you know, we've got this, we've got this country ostensibly quite anti-Catholic, and yet we've got these constitutional principles that are allowing us to operate. Uh, what explains that? And so built better than they knew is even if, even if you have sort of an anti-Catholic culture, we have a constitution uh, that is sort of etched into and is coincident with uh, constitutional principles that derive from the medieval era. And so there's actually a thick natural law accounting of American constitutionalism that has to be made. It can't just be a modern natural rights framework. The Constitution and its principles go back much further. And that's really what the founders were doing, even if they themselves were not aware of it. And so built better than they knew is this idea of now we develop, not that not we have a faulty Constitution or a faulty founding, but it allows us to sort of bring this greater exploration of these principles in the Constitution as we are met with these new challenges and those principles are not just Lockean or, or, a pro, or things that we derive just from John Locke, although that's certainly there. But there's a, there's, there's a much greater way of thinking about American constitutionalism. And so uh, one of those clear principles John Courtney Murray thought was that religious freedom was a good. And America constitutionally stood under God, not over God. And then the contrary application would be the French Revolution, which saw itself as displacing God in the church. And the American founding was, you know, the principles were very content that law was limited. It was in service of the human person. It stood under God. That was a, a component aspect of what it meant to be a human person and a citizen was to be a creature. And the American Constitution sort of ran alongside that and contributed to it. And, and so that notion of built better than they knew studies is to say that the Constitution is under development. And the best way of thinking about that development is a rich, robust Republican conversation in full accordance with the Western tradition. And the natural law legal tradition is certainly a part of that. And it's going to build on what it means to be a human person. That's evident in our state laws for the most part. Uh, for much of our nation's history, we've got some, we've got a, a dramatic problem. One of those is race. Um, and that's, that's a challenge that remains a challenge. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, that the constitution is at fault. It means there's, you know, it's an imperfect constitutional order. Nothing is perfect in the first position. It has to be developed, it has to be developed. And so that's what we are called to do. What has happened, and Peter talked about this a lot, was sort of this famous phrase of keeping lock in the lockbox. What has also happened throughout the 20th century is that we have defined American freedom in very individualistic, consent-derived ways, which fails to take account and make sense of the human person in our full relational dimensions. And so when Justice Kennedy writes a lot of these opinions in religion, 
marriage and human sexuality, what he is continuing to build back to is, well, there's just consent and who's to say what's right uh, between consenting adults. And that's the best understanding of, of human freedom. And I don't think that's, that's one way to think about American constitutionalism. It's not the only way. I don't think it's the way most consistent with our full tradition. And in any event, that way short circuits and hijacks this conversational Republican dimension that we need to have if we're going to develop our constitutionalism in the most robust sense, which is actually having citizens contribute to it and not it just not being merely an aspect of liberal philosophers on the court. Peter seemed to have a based off of what you just said, a very sobering view of, you know, the American constitutional order. And he also wrote about this about nostalgia in general and how it can blind both the left and right who, you know, pine for a halcyon era that he acknowledged we like we can't simply copy and paste into our com- contemporary reality. Um, but he believed that selective nostalgia could be useful. Um, I believe it was a first things piece where he wrote about this and um, he called Tocqueville's Democracy in America handbook for selective nostalgia because Tocqueville made it clear that there is no returning to pre-modern aristocracies, and that's a good thing, but Tocqueville recommends that the Americans destined for a literary career, for example, still study and the aristocratic features of uh, the philosophy of the Greeks and the Romans to learn from them. What are some other ways um, that selective nostalgia, as Peter understood it, do you think could benefit conservatives? And are there ways today that you think nostalgia clouds our judgment? Yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think a nostalgia that would think, well, our problem is capitalism, or our problem is modernity writ large, or our problem is things are no good anymore. Uh, well, what was good was, say, the 1950s. Um, what, what was good was, say, uh, Jacksonian America or something like that. What that ignores, I think Peter would say, Peter had this phrase, uh, things are getting better and worse at the same time. And I I think we should always keep that in mind. Um, There were a lot of, there there are some virtues to 1950s America. There are a lot of problems as well. And the problems aren't just race and they aren't just, you know, are women able to develop, you know, themselves as they might see fit. Uh, There are also problems in in America of the 1950s that just, you know, relate to, um, uh, I think, a, a scientific understanding of government uh, and of public policy. There was also sort of a clear forgetting, I think, of the Republican uh, dimension of our government um, uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and so there's the, the selective nostalgia runs all over the place. I think selective nostalgia has to be, in Peter's mind, uh, an awareness of the human person getting things right and wrong, no matter where he is, and, and just being aware of that and thinking about, well, what does it now mean um, to do what's right and, and to be true uh, to the best aspects of human nature? And so one would be like democracy, if, if we don't take, if we take democracy seriously, what it tends to turn everything into is equality and egalitarianism and leaves you without standards for judgment. Aristocracy, on the other hand, does that really well. It gives you very clear standards for judgment. And in fact, you know what to do. Uh, you know how to live. The problem with aristocracy is those who are making judgments and governing and ruling tend to be a select few. Um, And they tend to disregard, uh, in many respects, those beneath them as possessing those same qualities. Uh, And and so that's the weakness. So Tocqueville says, you know, I, I ultimately side with democracy because it accords greater respect for the human person. But it has all sorts of problems, right? He thinks it's more just. Um, but it, it, you know, it has all sorts of problems associated with it, one of which is, how do I know how to live? And how do I know how to be a human person? And am I going to actually have things worth defending, like human freedom, in the age to come? And he's not, he thinks that freedom will be the exception. The rule will be conformity, centralization, you know, forgetting that we have souls. He's, he's worried about pantheism, which would eclipse human liberty. Why? Because you see nothing distinctive about what it means to be human. You see nothing distinctive about specific communities. Everything is mass. Everything is centralized. So that's always at play. I, um, yeah, this, the, the selective nostalgia, I think, ignores the degrees to which human beings are always wrestling with good and evil and getting some things right 
and something's wrong. Conservatives uh, are subject to that. Uh, liberals are too, it seems to me, the way they sort of look back uh, and apply certain things. So yeah, I mean, if you were to think, I mean, the 1930s, you, you, if you look back to the 1930s, that's where we're already sort of developing this idea of, of the human family being sort of like a hotel. And we're already sort of, they're gonna have, we're gonna have like public schools, uh, we're gonna have factories, we're gonna have both parents working, and that's already coming together in the 1930s. There's a reaction against that actually. Um, and then there's a reaction against that reaction. <laughs> uh, now we don't really know <laughs> what, what to do, uh, it seems to me, regarding the human family and these potentials for work and the need for nurture, the need for love. Um, and we're, so, we're sort of at sea again uh, in, in that regard in terms of what's, what's the distinctiveness of the family and its relationship to the market and the need to draw boundaries between the two. Um, one, you know, one other thing is just thinking about technology. Uh, technology is a tremendous good. It's also a tremendous disruption in our lives. Did we, I did not have, when the smartphone or the iPhone or came out, this tremendous disruption in how we were going to do politics and do markets and talk to one another and how it was seemingly going to degrade our interactions with one another. But there's also a tremendous possibility there, um, but we seem to be missing it. You know, so technology, even technological gains and productivity and economic growth themselves come with all sorts of problems and drawbacks. What's the solution? And it doesn't seem to me the solution is, well, let's just not do the technological gain thing. That seems impossible to me. It's how does one bring that in service of the human person? That's what Peter would, would say and, and write about. Well, you know, the uh, obvious solution to that problem, Richard, is to download the ISI app uh, because it has, you know, it's technology uh, for the use of the good um, instead of getting uh, folks plugged into the great ideas of Western tradition. No, but I do have a real question. One thing, so it seems like a little bit what you're talking about here is sort of kind of laying the foundation of the distinctions between the new right and the kind of fusionist right. Um, and one thing that I find fascinating is that people will invoke Peter's name on either side of this debate. Um, there are sort of some people who are more, I wouldn't maybe not call them classical liberals, but maybe fusionist conservatives and new right conservatives who both maybe wrote with Peter on the postmodern conservative blog, or will just invoke his name in general. How do you think he would have found our predicament? Because he was there for the beginning of Trump's presidency, but but it's, so, so much has developed within the movement since then. How do you think, how do you think he would have made sense of things? You know, I think, you know, Peter, what he was helpful for me in when I got to meet him and start working with him through Liberty Fund conferences, he, he sort of moderated me and, and my own thinking. And he helped me think more robustly about the demanding and complex requirements for the good in human communities, much less something like the United States of America and the you know, tremendous diversity and disagreements that we have in our country, and yet also recognizing human nature and that it doesn't necessarily change that much. And human communities are realizing it in different ways. And yet in America, we are sort of in this conversation with one another and thrown into that conversation with one another. I think Peter, if you read his writings, his political writings, thought that conservatism, particularly with the Mitt Romney campaign and the sort of the failure of the Romney campaign, had become too wedded to market economic thinking uh, about the good, at least in terms of what it was going to campaign on. Um, and he thought that was at fault. Peter, living in Rome, Georgia, teaching at Barry College, right? He's in a small community and he's in North Georgia which had, has experienced tremendous economic displacement uh, because it's an area where it had really created a middle class around um, carpet manufacture, carpet, and, and had sort of, you know, textiles and sort of had lost out in uh, the last 30 years. And so he saw a lot of economic displacement. Uh, he liked to work at Waffle House and he got to know sort of the servers at Waffle House fairly well. And, and so I think he understood that markets alone could not make us happy, and that there were losers in the new market order. And how should one talk to them? How should one talk to them? And I think that was that's a really good point. 
and uh, and it's one that's been realized and been forced upon a lot of conservative thinking uh, over the last five, six years. So I think he clearly understood that. Um, where I think he would beg to differ, um, well, he, you know, he dies in 2017. I don't think he thought, though, you could put things back together again with the federal government in quite the way a lot of elements of the new right do. Uh, he would agree with them on a lot of the degradations of the human person that we see, and I think they're aware of that. I largely agree with them on that. But the question is, what can you do with government? What can you reasonably accomplish? And what are the setbacks? And so I think, you know, like Peter with uh, same-sex marriage in our book, we wrote about that, and he thought a lot about that when it was a really live issue and, and debate. Um, was there a sort of, was there one solution to that? Uh, you know, Peter thought, you know, thought, you know, maybe the better solution was, uh, was a relational civil union requirement. Um, uh, and, and, but that needed to be negotiated. It needed to be negotiated in a Republican dimension with robust civil society, religious liberty associations and protections. And so he was always, I think, very cautious that there was a, there was just one policy solution. He wanted to see things negotiated in that regard. Um, so I don't know that uh, necessarily either side could claim him. Uh, you know, he tended to write things that could infuriate or offend or send a lot of people into disagreements. Uh, what he is, what his concern is, he would you know we start with human dignity, start with our relational aspects of ourselves, and what politics make the best sense. I think this idea that he had of libertarian means for non-libertarian ends, and so truly, what you want government policies to do is to serve is to serve our distinctive aspect of, of human personhood. Um, and that's also evident in his education writings. I mean, he was, he was not on board with um, using the federal government to create sort of, not that he was against safe spaces for conservatives on campus, but he didn't think the federal government could renew higher education the way I think a lot of the new right does. He wanted to build on what, what's the distinctive aspect of higher education in America? It's a lot of diverse colleges, different types of colleges that are out there. I think he identifies in uh, one of his last books, uh, eight different types of higher education experiences in America. So that would be non-libertarian end. What would be the libertarian means to best preserve that? That's what was being forgotten, he thought. Uh, and you, you know, so you see that clearly with like a social justice left trying to define, but you also thought he saw it in the corporate right wanting to conceive of higher education as just a market transaction that should serve a larger market end when you graduate. He thought that also was wrong. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, he's not, you know, it's not exactly easy to pin down. Yeah. You know, he kind of, um, I don't know, I guess this is what, so he kind of reminds me of Nisbet a little bit. Um, right. And some of his, and some of Nisbet's sort of anti, I mean, you might call it anti-status communitarianism or something like that, that Nisbet has, and I wonder if it did, did Peter read Nisbet? Was he influenced by, or was more Tocqueville? Cause obviously both were influenced by Tocqueville and Nisbet started doing his PhD oh, I, when Tocqueville yeah, Peter, comes I'm, I'm sure Peter read Nisbet, but largely yeah. thinking about this a lot, Tocqueville of lines of, yeah. of what, of what is the distinctive quality of human freedom in modern democratic times. And I think he, he thinks Tocqueville is the best articulator of that, uh, of that idea of relational liberty that will preserve political liberty for the most people. One other question we'd love to ask you before we get on to our final question we ask all of our listeners is tell us a little bit about the work you do at Law and Liberty and how Peter might have influenced that and even contributed to it over the years. Well, Peter was one of the first big contributors I had when I started in 2012 up through uh, when he died in, in May of 2017. He was a regular writer uh, for us and, uh, and one of our most thoughtful contributors. Um, uh, so what, what we're trying to do at Law and Liberty, one, we're published by Liberty Fund. So our goal is to defend uh, freedom and responsibility in a range of contexts. And also one of the ways that we're trying to do that is talk about a sober minded liberalism and defend the best of our institutions uh, in America that have allowed for tremendous human flourishing and which I think are being uh, forgotten. Uh, and, and shoved aside. So we are, we are big on separation of powers. We are big on federalism. We're big on markets, um, freedom of association, religious freedom, economic freedom, 
and we do a fair amount of cultural commentary and high-minded intellectual commentary in addition to just public policy. But yeah, that's that's our standard is is to defend. I think what's what's the best about America, and you know, somewhat grandiloquently to defend the West as a whole and what makes our civilization has made our civilization so great. And to try and I mean, I think sometimes we're just leaving a record of dissent <laughs> as in the wider realm around us. But that's okay. Um, yeah. Because you plant these things, and you never know what what can happen. We ask all of our guests this, what is conservatism? What did Lawler think conservatism was? I think he thought conservatism was trying to apply sort of an unbroken tradition of sort of the best of of the human condition. Uh, And that was a wide understanding. It was religion. It was culture. It was law, political philosophy. you know, the pursuit of, of, of liberal arts education, preserving the best of those things and then trying to write about them as we approach these distinct, come, you know, have these sort of problems thrown at us, whatever they may be. Uh, that was conservatism uh, for him. It wasn't so much, I mean, Peter loved politics. It, I mean, sort of amazing, this guy's mind, you know, basically had a book idea every week. <laughs> and yet he loved, he loved to talk about the senatorial campaign in Iowa, you know, and, and what was going, what wow. the sociology behind the politics. He was, it was it's sort of fascinating. He loved to talk about primaries and presidential campaigns, like what, what went <laughs> wrong in the, uh, you know, Georgia primary for these Republican candidates. So he loved politics, but he was never, that was, uh, it was not something he spoke about with like precise pronouncements. But he wanted to analyze our politics, I think, in light of these broader concerns and, you know, thinking about, say, certain failures within conservatism. I think he brought I think he brought something uh, that, that was missing in the in the sense of you got this wrong because you ignored this aspect of what it means to be a human being. And frequently his targets were conservatives. And so if it's, you know, if conservatism reconceived as just entrepreneurial innovation and and economic growth well that that misses the bulk of the gop voters who go to work every day not for entrepreneurialism but to take care of their families and quite frankly they don't like their bosses so quit talking about how great their boss you know stuff like that um <laughs> uh so yeah, i think the you know the conservatism and then what's best about the american tradition is it is it rights language or is it the republican dimensions of the constitution um, so I think there was, you're talking about someone, you know, uh, James mentioned he wants to read The Prince. And so you, you never, you know, you might see an essay of, uh, or thinking about Machiavelli on politics in relationship to healthcare policy or something like that, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the, but the conservatism of a, of a very broad tradition being applied, not in an ideological formulaic way. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? Law and Liberty is is my home. Uh, I write frequently for a lot of publications, including Modern Age uh, is, is one place I'm, I'm glad to call home. And uh, also I write for National Review, Washington Examiner, uh, among others. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Richard. And uh, upcoming on Conservative Conversations, be on the lookout for episodes on American history and C.S. Lewis. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI. Conservative Conversations with ISI.